So the title, as you can see, slightly changed. Um, it's now Science, Trust and Respect. And as Maria mentioned, uh, this is a paper I'm writing with Alfred Archer from uh, Tilburg University. But part of the research I, I will be presenting today is also based on another paper I wrote with Katarina Tinovaj, which is, who is a professor at Freie Universität Amsterdam. And that paper uh, was about public engagement and argumentation. But the topic of this paper is respect. So the aims of this paper uh, are understanding how and whether respect is connected to trust and when we uh, consider experts, non-experts uh, interactions and uh, what type of respect may be desirable in these interactions. So I will start by talking about public engagement in science as understood in the European Research and Innovation Funding programs. I will give an overview of uh, some benefits of doing public engagement in science and I will also mention some of the obstacles and challenges uh, sponsors and participants uh, to PE initiatives sometimes, well, often uh, face. Then I will explore the role of respect in public engagement, whether it is somehow connected to trust. And at the end of this paper, I will address the question regarding what type of respect is relevant to PE, so to mm, these interactions between experts and the lay public. So let's start from uh, European projects. Let's start from Horizon 2020. So Horizon 2020, as Peritia knows <laughs> quite well, was the European Research Innovation Funding Program running from 2014 to 2020. It adopted the responsible research and innovation approach, um, which, uh, among other things, understood as of pivotal importance that research and innovation are aligned to the values, needs and expectations of your of society. And one of the fundamental un underlying idea of Horizon 2020 was that science should be done with and for society, which meant that research and innovation should be the product of a joint effort of research communities and other groups of population, and that research and innovation should be focused on serving society. So the Responsible Research and Innovation approach had five priority areas and one of them was uh, encouraging public engagement in, uh, in science. So the idea here is that in order to successfully address society's challenges, for instance, climate change or global pandemics, the collaboration and contribution of different societal actors to scientific research and innovation is seen as essential. It is fundamental, it is beneficial, it is most of the times desirable according to this framework. So Horizon 2020 strongly encouraged public engagement in science initiatives. So these are initiatives that cre create channels, create um, spaces in which the scientific community and other groups of society can collaborate at various stages of scientific process, for instance, talking about research priorities or talking about the risk of using certain technologies in society. As far as we know, PE seems still a thing also for Horizon Europe, uh, um, which is the current uh, European funding program for research and innovation. So let's now give some more details on what public engagement is, in particular with reference to Horizon 2020 framework. So PE is not new. Uh, PE practices have been used in science for decades before these programs were uh, developed. Uh, but uh, we can say that PE has attracted a lot of attention practices became more widespread also thanks to these uh, projects, uh, thanks to Horizon 2020 and its predecessors, FP7. So a number of projects have collected data on PE initiatives, the initiatives that have been uh, developed in these last years and attempted to make some uh, categories and you can find some of these categories on this slide. And um, what we notice if we look at these studies and what they point out is that we can notice a shift from uh, PE initiatives aimed at science communication, science education, in which the, direc the direction of information flow was from experts to citizens, to public engagement initiatives that have encouraging and fostering collaborations between different groups of society uh, as their goals. So practices in which information goes from 
experts to citizens, but also from citizens to, um, to researchers, so both ways. Here uh, we can find a non-exhaustive list of benefits connected to doing public engagement in science. So public engagement is supposed to provide epistemic benefits uh, because while well, different groups of society may have different bodies of knowledge because of their social locations, because of their experiences, and these bodies of knowledge may count as valuable epistemic resources that if uh, included in the discussion and integrated in scientific uh, decisions may lead to, for instance, epistemic progress, the so-called local knowledge of citizens. Uh, so engaging with this knowledge is seen as essential to make progress in science and also to avoid errors in science. Public engagement is also supposed to provide some social moral benefits. For instance, uh, um, citizens may contribute with moral social concerns that uh, were underlooked by uh, researchers but are still important if we consider which research priorities we should go for or which risk we are willing to um, accept. Uh, and this is uh, seen as beneficial. And another benefit of public engagement is that, well, public engagement is seen as a strategy to gain or regain public trust in science. Public engagement is seen as one of the strategies to gain or gain public trust in science. Why is this so? Well, public engagement is expected to bring science closer to society by making research innovation more accessible, promoting uh, accountability, transparency, by showing that the research community has a genuine interest in addressing society's needs, in addressing society's ambitions. And all this is supposed is seen as uh, facilitating uh, increasing public trust in, uh, in science. Public engagement initiatives don't go always um, as planned, as wished. Uh, but we don't always get those benefits I just mentioned. It doesn't, they don't always deliver what sponsors and participants to initiatives hope they will deliver. So um, having a fruitful conversation or increasing public trust in, uh, in the scientific community. So here you can find, again, a non-exhaustive list of obstacles and challenges we may face uh, when doing public engagement. So for instance, surveys reveal that public engagement is sometimes perceived as a waste of time and energy by researchers. Uh, as a burden imposed by institutions with no real benefit. No real benefit for, um, uh, for researchers because while well, these resources are um, seen often by researchers, uh, epistemic and social resources provided by citizens are irrelevant or noxious, like um, citizens have, um, researchers say, uh, often impossible expectations about researchers, so we are not going anywhere. And no benefits for science in general, since indeed, if these resources are not very interesting, why should we uh, talk about these resources? Uh, there are also managerial difficulties in public engagement. So difficulties that impair the creation of fruitful collaboration, the chances to increase public trust in science. So. For instance, uh, it, is, it seems that managing conflicts between parties, participants to uh, public engagement initiatives is not such an easy task. We have people who might mm, uh, have very different views on values and needs and uh, expectations they have. We also have motivational obstacles. So when a sponsor try to organize public engagement initiatives, we might see that some groups are particularly hostile to public engagement or suspicious about why do scientific communities want to do these things with us? I don't trust them. And also cultural obstacles, so it's not always easy to find good uh, communication strategies to convey content to different groups. And a further obstacle is that public engagement may easily perpetuate harms and reinforce uh, old power dynamics in science. I think, for instance, uh, uh, participants sometimes complain they fear researchers do not really listen to them. They pretend they do. And uh, that their questions and concerns are easily dismissed. Uh, and th this usually doesn't uh, help with increasing trust uh, and for good reasons, I guess. However, the literature tells us that there are a number of factors that may help making public engagement practices successful, uh, successful in, in creating uh, fruitful conversation and increasing public trust in science. Um, 
for instance, we know that people uh, tend to dislike uh, technical jargon, so initiatives that use very clear um, language work better than others. So in this paper, we uh, would like to explore whether uh, how we behave toward others in public engagement practices, how we conceptualize others, how we, uh, our idea of others, how we treat them, may have an impact on determining whether we will be able to build trust. So public engagement is understood as a possible strategy to gain or regain public trust in science. And public engagement is supposed to be dialogical practices, exchanges between experts and citizens. So what are the factors that may facilitate these exchanges and increase the chances to gain possibly warranted trust in science? Is maybe respect one of these factors? We uh, would like to focus on these questions in uh, in our paper, so uh, the literature has something important to tell us uh, about uh, all this. For instance, this study conducted by Dave and colleagues and published in 2017 aimed at identifying determinants of trust in community-based participatory research. So in community-based participatory research, we have a diverse group of stakeholders, community members, healthcare providers and academic researchers collaborate for the purpose of sharing authority and responsibility in planning research studies with a mutually beneficial research objective. So uh, these collaborations between experts and the lay public are understood as a valuable strategy to increase trust and involvement of minority groups and in health research. These collaborations have proved to be helpful to address, for instance, health disparities and uh, studies show that trust, uh, so having participants trusting each other in these uh, collaborations is crucial to make this practice successful. So the aims of that paper were uh, uh, identifying the factors that, contributing, uh, that contribute to creating and maintaining trust among participants, but also creating trust uh, in general in science. Uh, the results of the study and similar results uh, we have in other studies uh, is that respect is one of the central factors helping building trust among communities collaborating in uh, uh, research uh, projects. So respect, having a respectful relationship, being treated with respect was rated as one of the most important factors by these people participating in this, in this study to create and maintain trust among participants in a specific project but also to create trust in science in general, their, their idea of science. These are some of the elements uh, people associated to the idea of respect, what having a respectful relationship uh, meant uh, to them. Respect sounds quite important. What is respect? So we saw the empirical literature provides lists of factors partic mm, participants to PEC as traits of respectful relationship as connected to be treating with respect and respecting others. But we think philosophical literature may have something more to say about what respect is that was not um, considered. For instance, let's say how Robert, uh, Robin Dillon um, talk about respect. So respect involves a certain way of perceiving the object, namely regarding it as worthy. To, some, to respect something is to appreciate it, to recognize its value, or at the very least to regard it as important, and so as something worth paying attention to, worth taking seriously. Respect involves having and acting from certain positive attitudes towards the object. Respect involves believing that there is something about the object, some feature or fact about it, that makes it worthy of this kind of attention and the treatment. This fact or feature is the ground of respect, that in virtue of which it is worthy of respect. And importantly, uh, respect is object generated. So respect is grounded not in personal desire or interest, but in the nature of the object itself. So it's something we render. It differs from liking or loving, from fearing, all of which have their source in the agent's own desires and interests. So respecting something or someone is appreciating its value somehow, and we can even respect something we don't like, for instance, an opinion. Um, so respect has traditionally been studied as an attitude, as a disposition to respond to an object, for instance, person uh, which is triggered by an identification of some properties of that object. And if we go back to medical ethics, we see studies in which patients are 
uh, ask what respect means to them, what they understand as being treated respectfully. And some of these, of these studies, you can find them on this slide. And the factors patient mentions are things like, well, being provided with relevant information, uh, having a clear and concise communication, uh, seeing that mm, doctors are uh, I have a special attention to patients' cultural background and uh, the doctors admitting uncertainty when there is uncertainty. Uh, what is interesting to notice here is that this literature shows that possibly in order to understand the notion of respect and its role in increasing trust in uh, experts in science, when we consider experts and non-experts relationship, we have to go beyond autonomy, which was uh, the main focus of the great majority of studies in philosophy. Of course, there are also other approaches, for instance, we don't talk about care and respect, but yes, th these studies will be very useful to understand what we should mm, focus on when we want to understand what respect is. Then I'll conclude with this uh, further question uh, that we might ask is uh, what type of respect should be cultivated and this is not really explored uh, in, in these interactions so what type of uh, respect should be cultivated in public engagement or when we consider more generally the um, uh, expert and non-expert relationships so respect can be for a person can be understood as a relationship be between three key aspects so two subjects a basis of respect, some feature being possessed by an individual makes her for free of respectful treatment and an evaluative point of view, for instance, a moral point of view. So if we consider experts and non-experts interactions, uh, what might count as an appropriate basis, as a relevant feature that make participants to be as worthy of respectful uh, uh, treatment? Uh, and uh, this, to conclude, uh, in order to explore these questions, we plan to consider this distinction, this influential distinction suggested by Darwell between a recognition respect and appraisal respect. Uh, so two different ways uh, which, in which person may be, to, may be the object of respect, two different attitudes, uh, depending on the feature we consider. So when it comes to recognition respect, so to have recognition respect for persons is to give proper weight to the fact that they are persons. So this is the sort of respect we usually say we owe to all persons. So persons are entitled to, this, to have others take them seriously and weigh appropriately the fact that they are persons when deliberating what to do, how to act, for instance, how to respond to their contributions. And appraisal respect, uh, well, it's a, a positive appraisal. And the appropriate ground for this type of respect is that the person has manifested characteristics that make them deserving of a positive appraisal. So objects of this type of respect are persons who are held to manifest their excellence, Darwin says, as persons. So persons uh, who manifested characteristics which them make them deserving of such positive appraisal. This is closer to esteem. So the relevant feature in the first case, a recognition respect, is being a person. And the relevant feature as a basis for respect, for appraisal respect, is uh, being good of something, being um, uh, seen as uh, valuable in some ways uh, because you are a good painter or a good climber. So, uh, on our idea is that both types of respect should be encouraged, cultivated when planning public engagement initiatives, when training experts in public engagement. So public engagement practices should be developed and implemented in an at atmosphere of respect that takes both recognition and appraisal respect as important. So if we have a look at European documents about Horizon 2020, for instance, and how citizens are understood, conceptualized there, so citizens in the object of appraisal respect. The citizens are entitled to have a role in scientific decisions. They deserve our attention because they are good at something, at providing, for instance, local knowledge, which is fine. It's oh, actually very important. But there is no clear uh, understanding on how recognition respect might have a role in these interactions. It's, um, not made explicit. The other type of respect, uh, recognition and respect, should not be forgot. So the fact that participants to PE are people and deserve respectful treatments, regardless of whether they can make valuable contributions. These might sound quite trivial, but we think we should think about this a bit more. And this is important because forgetting about recognition respect uh, uh, may be one of the reasons why we end up having problematic situations in PE. 
and uh, there are a number of things uh, we can consider. But the general idea is that the type of respect that will be cultivated in this public engagement uh, environment uh, might have an impact on researchers' deliberations and actions, how they will decide how to weigh pieces of information, how they will decide to, how to interact uh, with uh, questions, for instance, when they think oh, this is not a valuable question. Think, for instance, of mothers uh, complaining about doctors dismissing their um, questions about vaccines and feel shame about that. And depending on the type of respect cultivated, depending on whether a type of respect goes forgotten or not, we may have a number of consequences and why one might be, for instance, epistemic trust injustices where you are not um, taken seriously in public uh, uh, engagement initiatives um, and uh, you feel like maybe you are being disrespected and you will not trust. So you will not have the conditions to trust experts. Thank you so much.